Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Okay, a little housekeeping here. Gearing up for a day-long conference in Sydney with Eric Weinstein, Brett Weinstein, Douglas Murray, and Majid Nawaz. That should be fun. That's the first time we've all gotten together. Unfortunately, the conference we had planned for Auckland got canceled. So anyone who bought tickets to that will obviously get a full refund. You should contact Pangburn Philosophy for that. But uh, I am looking forward to going to Sydney. I don't get down there very often. So if you're in Sydney or want an excuse to go there, perhaps from Melbourne or even Auckland, it should be a very interesting day of conversation with those guys. My event in San Francisco with Yuval Noah Harari in September is now sold out. So hopefully if you cared to be there, you got tickets. I may get that audio for the podcast. So uh, stay tuned for that. I'm now going to break for my pre-recorded segment wherein I give my philosophy on funding the show and explain why I don't rely on ads. This section about funding is exactly seven minutes long. If you've already heard it, you can feel free to skip it, just like you can skip the ads in any other podcast just like I skip the ads in every podcast I listen to. But if you haven't heard it, I hope you listen to it once. In fact, I'll soon be speaking with Jaron Lanier next week, and Jaron's thinking about the digital economy and the price we're paying for using ads to support it has influenced me, I think, more than anyone else's. So that'll be coming in a couple of weeks. Now for seven minutes of mercenary flogging of a captive audience, and then I'll be back with today's guest. I'd like to take a few minutes to explain why I don't run ads on the podcast, and why I've decided instead to rely entirely on listener support. Of course, if you already support the podcast, feel free to skip this section. Just think of this as the part of the show that would otherwise be filled up with ads. And for those of you who haven't heard me talk about this, or for those who might be regular listeners but feel that I should run ads, like every other podcaster, I'd like to explain my philosophy around funding this work. And you might find some of this surprising, because I actually do. I don't want to run ads here, even for products and services that I love and use myself. And there are many reasons for this. For example, the New Yorker magazine recently inquired about sponsoring the show. Now, I love the New Yorker. I've read it for 30 years. It's one of the best magazines on earth. But it also, from time to time, publishes articles that are inaccurate or highly misleading, especially where science is concerned. And what listeners value most from this podcast is my effort to get at the truth. You want to know what I really think. And I don't want to create any incentives that could make it more difficult for me to simply tell you what I think. If I were taking a lot of money from The New Yorker, would I be free to say that one of its writers had just published something scandalously stupid? Maybe. But the point is, I don't want to have to think twice about whether something I think is important to say might upset a sponsor. And you don't want me to have to think about that either. My goal with this podcast is to create a forum for honest conversation of a sort that scarcely exists anywhere else. I want to talk about the most pressing issues of our time without looking over my shoulder and worrying about who might be offended. And there's no way I could do that while depending on ads. But that leaves us with a challenge of how to fund the show. Many of us regularly pay $3 for a cup of coffee, and we don't think twice about it yet it would suddenly seem onerous to pay $3 for something that actually brings us much more value than a cup of coffee ever could. I'm guilty of feeling this way myself, and frankly, it wasn't until I started podcasting that I saw the situation from the other side. And asking for listener support is something that I approached with real trepidation in the beginning. However, having done it, I've discovered that it's actually the most straightforward relationship I can have with an audience, and that really was a surprise to me. Just think about it. If you want to read one of my books, you have to buy that book before you even know whether you'll find anything of value in it. And if I want you to read one of my books, I have to convince you to buy it before either of us know if you'll find anything of value in it. That is a strange transaction, and it almost never reflects the actual value given or received. Plus, there are publishers and booksellers standing between us. There are people trying to get you to buy a book, and there are people trying to get me to sell it to you. But this podcast is free so everyone can listen to it, which for the purpose of spreading ideas is the best situation possible. I'll reach more people within 24 hours of releasing the next episode of my podcast than I will over the course of a decade with my next book. And if some of you find this podcast valuable, 
then you can support it to the degree that you do find it valuable, which is the transaction that most honestly reflects whatever benefit you get from my work. And it's born of a direct connection between you and me. There are no third parties here with their own interests. Now, it's a problem that so many people expect to get podcasts and other digital media for free. We've trained ourselves to expect this by creating an internet economy based on advertising. But advertising is not free because these companies want some of your time and attention. That's what they're paying for. And every podcast that relies on advertising contains five or ten minutes or more where the host reads ads. So there's this cost to the host's honesty or perceived honesty. If I spent the first five minutes of every show trying to sell you a mattress, you could reasonably worry about whether my enthusiasm for it was sincere. I mean, what else might I exaggerate if I'm willing to assure you, week after week, that memory foam will solve all your sleep problems? By self-funding this platform together, we're creating one of the only forums that is truly free from the outside pressures that are conspiring to make honest conversation on hard topics so rare. Now, digital media is experiencing a race to the bottom, and the reliance on advertising is what is dragging it down. Most of what we're worried about with companies like Facebook and Google, the invasion of privacy, the undermining of our politics, the spread of misinformation, can be directly attributed to their reliance on ad revenue. What we need is a new ethic and culture of sponsorship, where each of us takes the time to support work we value. Otherwise, the work won't get done, or it won't be nearly as good as it could be and it will always be compromised by bad incentives. Even the best newspapers and magazines now resort to clickbait headlines and hit pieces designed to maximize traffic, because they have to sell ads against that traffic to survive. The result is absolutely toxic. Even the people at the pinnacle of mainstream media, people being paid tens of millions of dollars a year, can be fired over a tweet, or because they express an unpopular political opinion, even on their own platform. Depending on what you do for a living, you might feel this same pressure yourself. What do you think is true, or might be true, or might be worth discussing with an open mind that could get you fired if said in the wrong context? I'm working to create a platform where I can think out loud about precisely those things with the smartest and most courageous people I can find. And I need your help to do this. Again, I totally understand the reluctance to pay for media online, and I feel it myself whenever I hit a paywall. But more and more, when I decide that there's something I value, I just automate my support for it. This is what I'm doing with other podcasts and blogs I follow that rely on audience support. And it's what I now do with charitable organizations like the Against Malaria Foundation. I don't want to have to keep rediscovering my commitment to saving kids from malaria. I just want to decide once and then know that I'm supporting this work at a level that I'm comfortable with. So for those of you who are regular listeners who derive value from my podcast, I want to encourage you to support the show at a level you're comfortable with. But I also want to be clear about one thing. There are some of you who shouldn't support the show no matter how much value you get from it. If it causes you any financial stress to give even a few dollars a month, then my appeal for listener support is not directed at you. For everyone else, please know that the small percentage of you who have begun funding the Waking Up podcast in a recurring way, whether monthly through my website or on a per-episode basis through Patreon, are making it possible to keep the podcast going, ad-free. And if the show grows in interesting ways in the future, it will be because of regular contributions, even in small amounts, from listeners like you. So thank you. Okay. Well, this is the kind of conversation I've been wanting to have about race for quite some time. It's also the kind of conversation that justifies my decision not to rely on ads to fund this podcast. At the end of these two hours, I think you'll recognize that you haven't heard people talk about race this way in a mainstream forum. And there's a reason for that, because this is just a minefield. Now, as I make clear at the beginning, I'm sure there are other ways of interpreting some of the data we cite on economics or crime, for instance. And I'm aware that there are other sides to many of these points. But all you've heard in the mainstream media are the other sides. And often the most tendentious and sanctimonious and bullying versions. There is an orthodoxy on the issue of race. And it's taboo to question it. 
and it's growing increasingly clear that the orthodoxy is leading us in the wrong direction. Now, after the atrocious podcast I did with Ezra Klein, and all of the poison I wound up drinking online in the aftermath, I realized that I had a choice. I could avoid the issue of race entirely, or I could continue to speak about it honestly. I've made my choice, apparently, because this is an important issue. In fact, it's one of the most important issues we have because it is so divisive. So I've been wanting to have a discussion like this for months, and I found the person who could best walk me through this minefield quite by accident and in a somewhat unlikely place. My guest today is Coleman Hughes. As you'll hear, Coleman is still an undergraduate at Columbia, majoring in philosophy. However, he's written some extraordinarily brave and well-reasoned pieces in the online magazine Quillette on race. So I brought him here to discuss his writing, and I also made sure he would be invited to the conference we're doing at Lincoln Center in New York in November. Anyway, I really appreciate that Coleman has had the courage to tackle the subject head-on. I felt like I was talking to a person from the future, or at least one possible future. A future where there's no such thing as identity politics, and people of goodwill can just talk about social problems without feeling like they're walking a tightrope. But in this world, in the year 2018, we're still on that tightrope. And throughout this conversation, you'll hear me periodically look down and marvel at how far there is yet to fall. And the truth is, I expect a fair amount of malice to be directed at both me and Coleman from the usual suspects for what we say here. But that's fine. I used to be operating under the delusion that that was avoidable. I no longer am. So, without further delay, I offer you Coleman Hughes. I am here with Coleman Hughes. Coleman, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me on. So let's get into your background for a minute because, you know, I actually don't know anything about it and it may be relevant to this conversation. This is something that I have remarked on on social media and as have, have others. You are still an undergraduate at uh, Columbia, which, given the quality of your writing, is incredibly annoying. <laughs> what, uh, what are you up to? What are you studying? And how did you get where you are now? Well, I'm studying philosophy. I have two more years to go. But uh, I made my way to Columbia. I actually, it took me a little while to get there. Right out of college, I went to a music conservatory. I went to Juilliard. I was in the jazz program there, set on becoming a professional musician. And I ended up leaving after around a semester when I, I had a death in the family and took about a year and a half off and then started college properly at Columbia when I was about 20. So I'm 22 and I have two more years to go with my philosophy degree there. Mm. And and what are your interests in philosophy? I like philosophy of mind. I think that was initially what got me into it. Books by Daniel Dennett, Consciousness Explained. I remember reading that and thinking that, you know, philosophy was something that was interesting enough for me to do for four years. Yeah, well, so this is, uh, the irony here is that we probably won't talk uh, at all about the philosophy of mind, even though it is my primary interest. And, um, you know, this is going to be a conversation that is framed by the path that we have both taken here that is a path that I've continued to think about as the path of opportunity costs. Because, you know, the place where you're currently making your mark and where your voice is being recognized as indispensable is on a topic that I think you probably find intrinsically boring, or at least not the among the most interesting. And because you're, you're having to endlessly spell out arguments that probably, in most cases, shouldn't even have to be made. And yet it's absolutely vital that you make them, given how incentivized people are to remain confused on some extremely important topics. And I've done this in a similar way with respect to religion and the conflict between reason and faith and science and religion, I consider almost everything I've written in that area to be a kind of opportunity cost. And it seems to me you're probably doing a similar thing on race. But again, it's very important that you do it because you, know, you have written these four articles 
in Quillette. I think it's it's four, right? Yeah, I think four in Quillette, yeah. Which I'll kind of treat as a, a single text for the purposes of this conversation. And they're among the best things I've read on the topic of race and the problem of identity politics now. And I mean, this is, this is all very much of the moment post-Trump. And it's just amazing to have you, again, as an undergraduate, making sense like this. So before we dive in, there may be a few caveats and, and warnings to issue, but just one question by way of background is, how much pushback have you gotten for your views? So I guess I should spell out what may or may not be obvious for anyone coming to this conversation. You're African-American, right? Are both your parents black? Uh, my, my mother's Puerto Rican, but most people saw her and assumed she was black. Both my parents are people of color. My dad's African-American. So have you gotten a lot of pushback for what you've written? I've gotten a lot of pushback on Twitter, especially for the most recent one. The first few were, you know, there was good comments, bad comments. But this last one, it was like nine to one negative comments. I've gotten some pushback in real life from from people who disagree with me. But I always find disagreements in real life face to face tend to go much better than on Twitter or wherever else online. So yeah, I've, mm. I've gotten plenty of pushback. I can imagine you have, and I, I think I noticed it more for the last one as well. But I, I, you know, if the pushback I get for retweeting you is any indication, I think what you're doing is highly controversial. I mean, and it's the pushback I get just crystallizes the problem for me. I mean, you know, so in my world, when I retweeted your last article, you know, I was sincerely praising a person who I had never met whose writing I admire. And yet on planet left, you know, I was uttering racist dog whistles and, you know, probably worse, promoting an Uncle Tom who for some reason is producing highly cogent arguments that a white supremacist like myself finds useful. This is the problem because if in my world retweeting the article of an African American that I agree with, that I think is amazingly well written, is further testimony to my racial bias. There's just no way to dig out from there. And yet, there is a slight irony here because the color of your skin is relevant to this conversation because only someone with the color of your skin could do what you're doing right now. And so, I mean, a, a white guy can't be writing the articles that you're writing now. And that's not a good thing. I mean, the purpose of this conversation is to figure out how to get to a, some possible future where all of us can talk about race and try to find some way forward that doesn't leave any of us open for just this reflexive smearing and character assassination that's coming from it predominantly the left here. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And the other irony here is that when you actually poll black people and ask them what they believe on any given topic, whether it's racial preferences or you know, the influence of rap on society, you sometimes find astonishing results, which would be astonishing to some people, right? You know, I, we can get into these polls, but for example, Gallup did a poll in um, 2016 that found that over 50% of black people said that race should play absolutely no role in college admissions. So clear majority. Another poll back in 2008 found that 71% of black people said that rap was a bad influence on society. And I'm, I'm sure if you disaggregated that by age, you would find my grandparents' generation virtually unanimously hating rap and my dad's being lukewarm and then my generation being a little more positive. But nonetheless, none of these views can be racist if the majority of black people hold them, right? And it's, it's like, when I go to my family reunion, there is plenty of disagreement on all of these topics. There's clearly a way in which decrying and rehearsing the history of racism has become a sort of sacred value in the black community. But you know, poll results show that there's plenty of room for disagreement here just among black people. And it can't possibly be racist 
for white people to happen to have the same views as many black people. Yeah, well, that's a fantastic point. Just one big picture caveat before we dive in, and I want, and we'll start there with opinion in the black community. But we'll cite statistics at various points of the sort that you just cited. And let's just acknowledge at the outset that many things here are debatable. I mean, we can cite data that can be, I'm sure, counterposed by other data. We might interpret data in ways that are open to criticism. But the reason why I'm having this conversation is that, you know, one thing seems to me to be not debatable, and it's that if we want to get to a colorblind society at some point, and this would be a society where people are actually judged by the contents of their characters, we can't care more and more about race. Clearly, the path forward at some point has to be characterized by caring less and less about it. And that's why identity politics seems like such a dead end to me. But I think we have to acknowledge that you know, one of the downsides of our having this conversation now is that you and I are both guaranteed to be smeared by the left for allegedly having an agenda that's bad for black people. Now, I, I don't know why you would have such an agenda. I know why I would will be accused of having it because I'm not black. But we should just acknowledge that this is, I mean, we're, we're, we're having this conversation because we think it's important to have, and we're trying to find a path forward that's good for everyone, black people included, and we have a vision of what that future would need to look like. And the path forward, you know, you and I haven't spoken yet, but I can only assume based on having read what you've written, we both agree that the path forward can't be this continual shattering of the political landscape into competing victim narratives. So anyway, that's just, I'll flag the the masochistic pain we're walking into at the outset. And then um, let's j- jump in where you just started, this diversity of opinion in the black community, which, I mean, frankly, th- those poll results were surprising to me. I mean, I, I was poised to agree with everything you were, you were writing, but I'm amazed to know that on many of these questions, like the question of whether affirmative action you know, to get into college is good, you can find a majority of Black people who think no, it shouldn't. You shouldn't be considering race at that level. Yeah, well, there's a framing effect here too. So if you ask the question, "Do you support affirmative action?" and you ask it that way, you'll get majority support among Black people, and if I'm not mistaken, you'll get a slight majority among white people too. But if you ask, if you just phrase it a different way, which is to say, if you just give a straightforward definition of what affirmative action entails you get minority support among blacks, which is to say majority dissenting, right? So the 2016 poll I just cited, I think the the way they phrased it is race, ethnicity, quote, should not be a factor at all in the college admissions process. So that seems to me an utterly clear definition of what affirmative action is. But if you just ask, there's a poll like one year earlier or one year later, I can't remember, that just asks it as affirmative action and gets a totally different result, which suggests to me that affirmative action has a kind of political halo around it, where you know, when you actually drill into the details of what that is, most people are uncomfortable with it. And indeed, most Black people are uncomfortable with it. But when you just package it under the political label affirmative action, it becomes unchallengeable. There's this phenomenon of Black conservatism that is surprising to people and and is just regularly ignored in the mainstream media. First of all, how would you describe yourself politically? Do you consider yourself a conservative or not? I've never considered myself a conservative. I've only ever considered myself either a liberal or a centrist. I voted for Hillary. I'm fairly sure if I had been old enough to vote, I would have voted for Obama twice. So I've never seen myself that way. It's just the way I see it on the topic of race, the political spectrum is like a frame shift three notches to the left where what would otherwise be a reasonable center left opinion is kind of reads as a center right opinion. What would otherwise be a pretty reasonable centrist opinion tends to read far right. So no, no, I don't think of myself as a conservative. 
but I'm certain that I've already been labeled that way and I don't invest too much in any of these labels, so I'm not going to fight it too hard. Right. There's that frame shift and uh, the people who are regularly described as conservatives or even gateway drugs to the alt-right in my world, including myself, are almost uniformly liberal. I mean, there's this whole intellectual dark web idea that has recently been popularized. There's probably one true conservative in that whole group of people, and yet we are described as you know, far right by many people on the left. But this phenomenon of black conservatism, to some degree, is mingled with the religiosity in the black community, because the black community tends to be more religious than the white. Is that largely part of it? Yeah, I, I cite this poll in one of my pieces from, I, I want to say his name is Theodore Johnson. He wrote a piece for the Washington Post. I believe that's his name. Yeah. He found that, well, 47% of blacks identified as liberal, 45% identified as conservative, which is yeah. you know, almost identical. And my sense is that that conservatism is more of a social conservatism. Like you mentioned, blacks are disproportionately religious and on many social issues would tend to be more in line with you know, a, a center-right perspective. And Johnson's opinion about why it is that blacks vote so overwhelmingly Democrat, despite being evenly split between liberal and conservative, is that there is a sense that the Democratic Party is the party that stands up for civil rights. It could be as simple as the fact that Lyndon Johnson happened to be president during the 60s, but I, I don't think it's just that. My gut tells me it's also just the fact that if you put a true neo-Nazi in front of me and just ask me to bet on who he voted for in the last election, I could win money all day betting that he voted for a Republican. And that proximity to the truly racist fringe of the Republican Party at least seems to sully that whole half of the political spectrum as far as many Black people are concerned. You know, understandably so, and also the fact that there's, on many issues, not all that much difference between the two parties would just increase that effect. So it's interesting that it comes back to this issue, which you um, dissect out very much in the spirit of a, an academic philosopher, that it, it is, at minimum, strange to accuse a white person of racism for holding views that, on any given poll, a majority of black people can be shown to hold. I'm looking at this one passage in your article where you say, for example, if a white person were to say, I don't think racism holds poorly educated blacks back, it would mark them on the left as woefully ignorant of systemic injustice, if not downright racist. But a 2016 Pew poll found that 60% of blacks without college degrees said that their race hasn't affected their chances of success. If a white person were to say that rap music is a bad influence on society, it might mark them as subconsciously prejudiced in the minds of many on the left. But according to a 2008 Pew poll, 71% of black people agreed with this statement. So again, I mean, it's possible to hold, I guess, any view, however correct, for the wrong reasons. But the litmus test for racism can't be holding any of these views, which, which leads me to ask, how should we define racism in your view? What is the appropriate indicator of racism? When can we be sure we're correctly diagnosing it in other people? That's a very interesting question. One perspective on that is to take what I perceive to be a linguist perspective and say, every word evolves, evolves over time, and language is a bottom-up distributed phenomenon that we can't control. So if it just is the case that people nowadays want to define racism as something Black people, by definition, can't participate in, then who are we to say that that definition is wrong, right? Because words are only what they mean to people at a given time. But then there's another perspective that would say, listen, we need this word racism to mean exactly what it means. It's too important. And you know, my biases are towards the latter. I have met, I, 
I, you know, I have people in my extended family that I could only describe as black rednecks in the same way that white people have white rednecks, right? Just, just people with usually older with just totally retrograde views about how you view other races. So I, I just, it seems silly and a little bit condescending to suggest that black people can't possibly be racist. Although, you know, I'll grant that if you define it that way, then it's, you know, it's, it's just a circular claim. But, you know, I, I guess racism is defined as, in my view, the belief that kind of essentialist characterization of a whole population of people who happen to share ancestry that holds that they're inferior, unfit for friendship and relationships and uh, just unfit to co-mingle with your race. I guess that's how I would put it. Well, let's make it even simpler. So what would you consider to be white racism with respect to blacks? What's the bright line there? And how do we know we've crossed it? I guess on some level, you have to go by somebody's behavior. So if somebody walks up to me on the street and calls me the N-word, in a tone that makes it totally clear that they are denigrating me. That person's obviously racist, and there's just, just no reason to mince words about it. But if someone, you know, if someone behaves in a way that I find objectionable, but hasn't said anything racist, I, I think people tend to make these kind of subconscious claims about other people's motives. They, they tend to mind read a lot, and instead of attacking what you say, they impute motives onto you. So what is the bright line? I guess it's just behavior that is clearly racially skewed. I mean, you could look at an instance like the Starbucks fiasco recently, where two black men were arrested for going into a Starbucks, not paying for anything, asking to use the bathroom. And it just seemed like it was too quick. The fact that the worker at Starbucks called the cops on them, it just seemed too quick to not have been racially motivated at all. And on some level, we just can't know. So it, it's hard to actually be agnostic because there's, the incentives are just to have an opinion, right? If you go out on Twitter and you say, well, I, I don't know, I actually don't have an opinion on whether that was racist, then you'll be accused of equivocating about racism, downplaying it. I think in many instances, it's just wiser to actually be agnostic until you know the facts. Yeah, well, I, I totally agree there. With respect to that case, I simply don't know enough of the details. I mean, so much of this is based on people's behavior and just the kind of crime that has been suffered in that neighborhood and, you know, the awareness of all the people involved. I mean, I don't know who the barista was and, you know, how street smart they were or not. So you can imagine two extremes where it's just straight up racism based on the conscious racial prejudice of the person working at Starbucks, or it could have been a totally plausible judgment call based on a thousand cues that are very difficult to describe consciously, but which at a glance people can take in, you know, when they're feeling afraid of other people. And there's just no generic solve for all those situations. And it's not even the case that skin color is never relevant, you know, or race is never relevant in those situations. We'll talk about crime in the black community at a certain point and no doubt receive some punishment for even having that conversation. But, you know, there are many cases where being a white guy looking a certain way should put other people on their guard for a higher possibility of crime. I mean, is it, you know, the example I've used before, which is by no means far-fetched, is I mean, if you see a couple of you know white guys with shaven heads and the appropriate tattoos standing in the parking lot of a black church, right? Those guys suddenly become very interesting because of their race and because of their haircuts. Merely to be standing where they're standing from a crime prevention point of view, to tell anyone you know who's working in a store or you know just living their lives that they can't use those kinds of intuitions, which are driven bottom up by the statistical reality of crime in our world, 
is enforcing a kind of dangerous stupidity on people. And yet, given the environment, I'm sure we're there where people are, are feeling like they can't act on intuitions, which in the moment can be totally valid. Yeah, I, I agree. I think the brain is a pattern finding machine, and it is a highly politically incorrect pattern finding machine. And if it, if in your personal experience, you find statistical regularities with regard to what types of people look a certain way and how they tend to behave, you will form a kind of, you know, a kind of alarm in certain situations, whether you want to or not. It's really not up to you. And there have been some interesting cases where, for, for instance, black people have themselves admitted to, you know, if they live in a certain high crime area, let's say, where they just notice that the people who tend to commit crime tend to look a certain way, right? They tend to be black. Let's just stipulate that in this particular area, that is the case statistically, right? They, they, you could, if you heard someone had just committed a robbery in this particular city, you could win money betting that that person was black over someone who was just betting by chance. And just like, you know, we could just say a hundred years ago, you could have said the same about the Irish and the Italians. You could have won money all day if you heard that there had been a murder betting that that person was Irish, for example, rather than German, American. So these trends change over time, but it's nevertheless true that we tend to form impressions and biases in, in situations not based completely out of thin air, although some stereotypes are totally out of thin air. Others are, are just rooted in observations, right? So there have been instances where prominent Black leaders have admitted to you know, having a, a, a fear, right? If you're walking in a certain neighborhood at a certain time. Well, Jesse Jackson, there's a fa that famous Jesse Jackson quote, which is right a, among the, the more honest things Jesse Jackson has ever said. Yeah. And there was also virtually the same quote by uh, a former president of Spelman University, a uh, Spelman College, whose name I'm blanking on, who said virtually the same thing. Do you remember the quote? No, I don't remember it off the top of my head, but the thrust of it was that Essentially, I sometimes fear black men. Yeah, I, I don't have it verbatim, but the gist of it was, this is the Jesse Jackson quote. He said, I'll tell you what I'm sick of. I'm sick of walking down the street at night, hearing footsteps behind me, feeling the fear, you know, the feeling the hair stand up on the back of my neck, and turning around and seeing that it's a white guy and feeling relief. That's basically the quote, and um, I'm sure he got a fair amount of pain for having said that. But I mean, the reality of, I mean, maybe we should just touch on the reality of crime in the black community just so that we don't sound delusional here. But the statistics on black on black violence, which is almost the totality of the crime problem there, in large measure, it's the totality of the crime problem in many urban areas that have high crime problems. I can pull up those specifically, but do you have some stats off the top of your head? Yeah, I have the FBI crime data here, just the national data. I think the, the latest year for which it's, it's available, 52% of homicides were committed by blacks. And that number has been relatively stable over the past two decades. It's hovered right around half basically every year. And you could just state it in reverse too. 50% of the homicide victims are also black. So it's a problem perpetrated primarily by black people and specifically black men and specifically young black men, and also suffered disproportionately by young black men. For instance, there is a data from the CDC that shows that if you look at black men ages 15 to 34, the number one cause of death is homicide. And even that slightly understates it because you might say, I'm sure the majority of that is in the younger half of that age distribution, but it's actually the case that if you disaggregate it, if you just go from 15 to 19, number one cause of death is homicide, you know, 20 to 24, still the number one cause, 25 to 34, still the number one cause. And that, that's a fact that can't be said about any other combination of age and ethnicity. And I, I think the important thing to keep in mind here is that among the things that governments do well, lowering crime rates actually happens to be one of them. 
So there's every reason to believe that this could come down given the right policies. So it's not just gratuitous to talk about it. Like I said, the rate of crime commission among the Irish used to be five times higher than the Germans in the early 20th century. Likewise with the Italians, it was maybe three times higher. And so we, we, know, we know certain ethnic groups have committed lots of crime in the past, and we know that those crime rates can be brought down with effective policing, with more policing and with better policing. And obviously the whole challenge is how do we get there? But it's going to be very hard to get there if we can't even mention the statistics that describe the problem. Yeah, and and they're actually a a little arithmetic makes them look a little bit worse, specifically for young black men, because African Americans make up about 14% of the population. And as you say, they commit and suffer at least half the homicides. But virtually all of this falls to men rather than women. We're really talking about you know, 7% of the population committing, you know, half the murders against, you know, largely the same 7% of the population. And when you see the crime statistics in a city like Chicago, the level of violent crime that makes America an outlier at the moment is largely driven by that phenomenon. And most people believe, at least on the left, that part of the problem is that Now there's this epidemic of police violence against young black men. We can touch on to what degree that's true or not, but the net result of that is that many people think that there's simply too much police focus on the black community, whereas, and I think you cite this book in one of your articles, is it Jill Lavoy who wrote the book? Jill Jill Leovi, and that's how I've been pronouncing it. Jill Leovi, yeah, yeah, sorry. I remember Glenn Lowry recommended that book to me, and you know, her argument was that what you actually find in certainly in urban, you know, gang ridden areas in, in America, in the black community is that it's a failure of policing. It's, it's the wrong kind of policing. It's, it's under policing of homicides. And we're talking about the consequences of the worst crimes virtually never getting solved and murderers walking free and everyone knows they walk free. And so you get this unwillingness of anyone in the community to cooperate with the judicial system to put the most dangerous people behind bars. And then you get this over-prosecution of petty crime, which is, you know, obviously terrible for any community and has been especially bad for the black community. I mean, as you say, there is very hard to argue that just less police attention is the solution here. Yeah. The way I think of it is this way. If an alien from Mars came to Earth and studied the past 10,000 years of human history with regard to homicide rates specifically, they would find the homicide rate in South Central Los Angeles and inner city Chicago and St. Louis and New Orleans, they would find that to be the norm. And they would find the homicide rate in Cambridge, Massachusetts, or other places where it's extremely low, to be the exception to the rule. They would find that to be the phenomenon to be explained. I take Steven Pinker's line in The Better Angels of Our Nature that much of the way this is explained is the state monopoly on violence, which is the police coming into town. You know, the stereotype is of the sheriff coming into town, and that, that's a true stereotype, right? Homicide and retributive violence is just something that young men tend to do everywhere on earth until they can no longer get away with it because there's a police force that punishes crime, specifically violent crime, swiftly and effectively and reliably. What's happened throughout history is that we have to remember eugenics was a totally mainstream progressive orthodoxy in the first half of the 20th century. So the attitude towards policing black communities was essentially to let them kill each other as an almost a form of population control, right? Yeah. So what happens there is that a culture of honor is allowed to survive, whereas white communities got the benefit of you know, more reliable policing, where black people, if someone kills someone and you're their brother, now you have to retaliate or else you, know, you lose face and there's just a never-ending cycle of retributive violence. Yeah, and, and that was explicitly stated. I mean, I remember reading some 
racist material of the time that, yeah, I mean, just, you know, let them all kill each other was essentially the, the view of the white community with respect to black violence. And yeah, it's one of these painful ironies that the left is getting this part wrong to great consequences. It's not that, again, this is, this is what's so toxic about this topic, to even discuss the disparity in the crime problem is controversial. Your motives are impugned to even touch this topic, and yet how could you possibly improve life for people in the black community if you weren't going to squarely focus on this disparity? Right. right. Like I said, there's no reason to suppose that it has to continue on this way. If you just assume that in the year 2050, the crime rate has continued to drop, because it, ha it has been dropping, especially in the 90s, it dropped precipitously. And just ask, what, what did we do to get there? It certainly isn't not mentioning the statistics at all. That, uh, that I can say for sure. And on the charge of racism, is it racist to notice in FBI data that whites are more likely to drive drunk than blacks and more likely to violate public drunkenness laws? I mean, you could wonder about why that is. I mean, you know, there, there could be a hundred different reasons why that's the case. And that could be an interesting research question. But if it's not racist to mention statistical disparities that seem to be unflattering towards whites, how, how can it be the same? You know, how can mentioning the same kinds of facts when they're the other way be racist? Well, so we'll, we'll talk about the origins of these problems and then and then the path forward. And, and the interesting thing is that understanding the origins may not actually indicate the path forward, or in many cases may be irrelevant to finding the appropriate path forward. And, and this will be interesting and controversial. But there are two paragraphs you wrote in one of your pieces that summarize the political dynamic here that worries me. And I just want to read those two so to kind of frame this part of the conversation. This is you now. Given America's brutal history of white racism, it is understandable that the pendulum of racial double standards has swung in the opposite direction. Indeed, it is a testament to our laudable, if naive, desire to fix history. But the status quo cannot be ma maintained indefinitely. Cracks in the reparations mindset are beginning to show themselves. And this is me now, the, the reparations mindset being the idea that because racist policies and systemic racism has created this problem, the remedy must come in, in some form of reparations from the government or policies or the white community to fix the damage here. Now back to you. Whites are noticing that black leaders still use historical grievances to justify special dispensations for blacks who were born decades after the end of Jim Crow, and many whites understandably resent this. Asian students are noticing that applying to elite colleges is an uphill battle for them and are understandably fighting for basic fairness and admission standards. The majority of blacks themselves are noticing that bias is not the main issue they face anymore, even as blacks who dare express this view are called race traitors. As these cracks widen, the far left responds by doubling down on the radical strain of black identity politics that caused the problems to begin with, and the far right responds with its own toxic strain of white identity politics. Stale grievances are dredged up from history and used to justify double standards that create fresh grievances in turn. And beneath all of this lies the tacit claim that blacks are uniquely constrained by history in a way that Jewish Americans, East Asian Americans, Indian Americans, and countless other historically marginalized ethnic groups are not. In the midst of this breakdown in civil discourse, we must ask ourselves, academics, journalists, activists, politicians, and concerned citizens alike, if we are on a path towards a thriving multi-ethnic democracy or a balkanized hotbed of racial and political tribalism. That just captures our moment perfectly, in my view. It's just, I mean, you, you and I are all too aware of what's happening on the other side of this conversation, this ridiculous and retrograde eruption of white identity politics, and, you know, in, in the sharpest case, white male identity politics. And it's easy to see this, an amplification in other forms of identity politics to be thought on the left to be the only possible response to this. But again, coming back to the basic fact, if we want to get to a society where 
everyone is treated as an individual capable of taking any opportunity they can take, at what point do you start treating people as individuals rather than as symbolic representatives of any given victim group? Yeah. One point I would, I would say there is I totally agree that the identity politics of the left can affect an, an equal and opposite identity politics on the right. If you look at someone like Jared Taylor, for example, who I don't know exactly how to describe him, but I think white identitarian, perhaps white national, nationalist, if you just look at the argument he makes, basically his entire argument is, listen, look what black people get to do. They get to organize around the variable of race politically. They'll say things like, you know, the black congressional caucus vets every bill that goes through Congress, not for its effect on America, but for its effect on black specifically. And then he'll, he'll just make the next logical leap. Why are white people the only one who don't get to do this? Now, that argument is based on a false premise, namely that identity really matters. But once you grant that false premise, the rest of the argument is, is pretty sound. And that's not good because th then it's, it's likely to be compelling to you know, some number of young white men. The other point you bring up is a point about sort of history and blame, right? So if you take a white murderer and a black murderer, they just hold everything constant in their lives, right? They've done, they've committed the same heinous crime. The attitude demonstrated towards the white murderer is not the kind of argument generally that, you know, someone like you might make about free will, which is to say, they're not responsible for their genes, nor are they responsible for their upbringing. Just put all the mixture of causes that led them to offend in a box. You couldn't pull out a single one and say they really caused this, right? That's as true of white people as it is of black people. The problem, I mean, all of that's true, but it's just impossible to actually have a criminal justice system that is constantly operating in that frame. We have to at least entertain the pretense of things like blame and praise just to get around in life, even if they're not deeply true, I would argue. Mm. And at the very least, whatever attitude we take towards free will and blame, it has to be consistent across the board. You can't just invoke slavery and Jim Crow to exonerate the behavior of a black person who is causing wreaking havoc on the innocent black people around him or her and not invoke those for other people, right? It's like the reason we blame people in the first place, it can't be deeply predicated on the fact that everyone is deeply responsible for who they are because nobody is. Right. We just need to be able to blame people in order to make society work. Yeah, and they're, and they're just these obvious comparisons, which, again, are radioactive to even make. At one point in one of your articles, you say, you know, Jewish people don't get to hate German people and get praised for it because of what the German people's grandparents did to the Jews, right? This is one of these disparities that you point out where in the work of an author like ta Coates, you can see expressions of what would be recognized to be racism in anyone else, but in Coates, he's canonized for it. Let's table that for a second, because I think we, we probably need to talk about Coates in a minute. But to stay on this, this larger point, you write about something you call the racism treadmill. What is the racism treadmill? The racism treadmill is essentially a pair of two beliefs that, in my view, virtually ensure that many progressives will never admit so long as they have these two beliefs that substantial progress has been made on the axis of racism in America. The first belief is that whenever you see a statistical disparity between blacks and whites, it's valid to reflexively assume that racial discrimination, whether it's systemic or overt, is the cause of that disparity, rather than the hundred or so other things that can be the cause of disparities. So I'll just take two quick examples to make this vivid. One is the fact that in the year 1952, there were four different Southern states in which black school teachers had higher salaries than white school teachers. 
that's fairly astonishing if you believe that politics and the racial biases of politics determine every outcome in the economy. But economies are extremely complex and there can be a lot of racism in the political sphere, but just bizarre trends with regard to supply and demand and various other economic forces can make it so that there is some disparity that can't possibly be explained by racism, because in this case, it favors blacks, right? Another example is if you just go to Wikipedia and look up household income by ethnic group, you'll find facts like uh, for every dollar earned by the average white American of Russian descent, or by the median white household of Russian descent, the median white household of French descent earns 79 cents. So both of those households would just be viewed as white at this point and probably would view themselves as white and you wouldn't be able to pick them apart. And yet you have the kind of disparity that if it were between blacks and whites would be presented in the pages of the New York Times and other respected outlets and reflexively ascribed to racism. And there are literally all kinds of disparities of this kind between different black ethnic groups. You compare Nigerians to Jamaicans, to Haitians, to African-Americans. You find all kinds of disparities that are never talked about or rarely talked about because they're too deflationary of the idea that every statistical disparity, disparity can be ascribed to some kind of discrimination. Right. And the second belief, which is closely related to the first, is just that every culture is identical in the patterns of behavior that are encouraged, in the values that are inculcated, in the kind of social incentive structure that leads people to behave one way rather than another, and that you know, there are no relevant differences to talk about. There are no differences that could possibly explain disparities. I mean, there's just no reason to believe that that's true. And I'm, I'm sure we'll get more into that. But once you put those two beliefs together, then you're in a situation where we're going to continue to have statistical disparities until the end of time. It's rarer to find, I mean, I actually don't know of a single example in which you take two ethnic groups, and by every metric, they are close, whether it's crime commission or income or whatever it is, even if they're of the same race. Right. So the idea that we should expect parity across the board in the absence of discrimination, all the evidence suggests the opposite, which is not to say discrimination can never cause disparities. It's, it's only to say that you can't assume that. It's just an empirical question. So you know, insofar as these two beliefs are ascendant, then people will never recognize progress no matter how much progress happens because we'll still have disparities and those disparities will still seem to prove that racism is a major force in society. Yeah, well, so, so let's talk about black culture here and the degree to which it may play a role because again, there are many disparities which are you know, accidental or explained by you know, hundreds of other variables that can, on their face, have nothing to do with white racism here. Because I mean, that the one that you just cited in some form here, and, and you cite in one of your pieces for Quillette, that within the black community, there's a, there's a massive economic disparity between West Indian blacks and American blacks with respect to you know wealth and I guess, attendance in, in the best colleges. And yet, in that case, we're looking at groups that also have similar histories of slavery. Right. In fact, West Indian blacks have, by all accounts, a more brutal history of slavery. Although, in some ways, it's been argued that though, the, for example, the infant mortality rate in the British West Indies was much higher than in America, in other ways, there were more advantages because blacks grew their own food and were sort of allowed to be entrepreneurial in a way that American blacks weren't. And, you know, it's reasonable to wonder if that had any cultural long-term consequence. But you're right. Yeah, the, the cultural differences between West Indian blacks and American blacks go back 100 years. So there, there, there was a, there's a great essay by Thomas Sowell entitled uh, Black Rednecks and, and White Liberals. And he cites data from the 1920s looking at 
blacks in Harlem living in the same exact neighborhood. And it, it was the case that West Indian blacks owned the majority of stores that were black owned in Harlem, even though they were by far the minority. I'm looking at the figures right now from your own piece. Though they comprised only 8% of the U.S. black population in a 2010 census, 41% of African Americans attending Ivy League schools were of immigrant origin in 1999. And then I think the financial data is that West Indian black families were out earning American black families by 58% and even out earning the national average income by 15%. And I guess this is from Sowell as well. And he says, you know, neither race nor racism can explain such differences. Obviously, these groups are both, quote, black and also subjected to whatever ambient level of white racism they were subjected to. Let's just step back for a second defensively. What do you do with the fact that people like Seoul have been so successfully demonized on the left as having his own weird axe to grind? I've lost track of the main angle of attack against him, but if you use his name or some of these other people you've cited, we'll talk about Amy Wax in a moment. She's just plutonium on the left, as is someone like Charles Murray. How do you think about that with respect to you know, writing a piece like this? Well, it's interesting that if I hear someone criticize Thomas Sowell, I never see them quote him. Because there's not even, I mean, I've read, I must have read 10 of his books, something like that. And there's really not a single sentence that you could even lift out of context to make him seem self-hating or racist. I mean, the guy's an economist. He's highly analytical, highly empirical. There's just, I mean, it's, it's telling that he's just never quoted in criticisms of him, either because people aren't reading his books or just because there's actually nothing damning to find there. I would argue the same about Amy Wax. I've read her book about race and I, I thought it was fantastic. Anyway, so do you want to just go back to these disparities yeah. between... Let's talk about a disparity that is on its face fairly innocuous and suggests something about the role of cultural preference here. I actually have the text in front of me from your article, but you could just summarize it if you want. This difference in the percentage of professional baseball players who are black versus professional basketball players who are black, and the fact that in the first case, that this organ of liberal ethical omniscience, Vox, determined that this had to be the result of racial bias in Major League Baseball, or that, you know, white fans want baseball culture to stay white. How do you think about baseball versus basketball? It's anecdotally true and utterly uncontroversial among most black people to admit that basketball viewed as more culturally black in the black community than a sport like baseball. Absolutely true growing up. I think most people who know a lot of black people probably have noticed this. And you know, it's unclear why that would be taboo to mention. It's also unclear why that wouldn't have consequences, you know, for the racial makeup of organizations like the like the MLB and, and the NBA. Right. But that's just a paradigm example of a, of a cultural difference creating a massive disparity that everyone who watches these sports is noticing every time they watch the sport, and there's no one sounding the alarm. There's a kind of maybe professional narcissism creeping in here where journalists, you know, who are always highly educated will assume that everyone in the world must value education as much as they did. It's actually not true. A lot, a lot of people care more about sports than they do about writing. And, you know, you just can't jump from seeing a statistical disparity in the world of education, for example, to going to discrimination. And, it, and it's telling that people I mean, rarely do this, although Vox somehow manages to with something like baseball. You make a point about culture in one of these pieces that is very important to make because it, you say, I think, that culture has a life of its own and that blaming culture for a disparity that may be a consequential one that we want to rectify, I mean, a disparity, say, in you know, levels of crime, blaming that culture is not the same thing as blaming individuals. No individual is responsible 
for the culture that got hammered into his head from the moment he or she was born. And we all make our own contributions to culture, but again, those are the result of all of these influences, biological and environmental, that get summarized as ourselves in each moment. So to say that there's something about a culture, there's something about one culture that is better or worse than another culture with respect to any variable, let's say it's crime or you know promoting literacy or anything else, that is not to be victim blaming in this narrow way of blaming individuals narrowly for just not having gotten their act together. Right. And it's interesting to think of what you would have to believe in order to disagree with that. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm disagreeing with you that no one is responsible for the culture they're born into and that we're all massively influenced by the cultural norms that we're just accidentally born into. If I'm going to disagree with that, then I have to admit that traditional societies that may have practiced something like cannibalism, right? I would have to say that they're just all waking up every day choosing to do that in a cultural vacuum, right? Like, right. That actually does seem racist. That's, that's part of the irony here. The dilemma here is that there is no non-racist way to worry about significant disparities here because either you're blaming biology or you're blaming culture and both are racist. Right. And, uh, and you're right to point out the different specific cultural values that, that will vary. So for, for example, if you're going to talk about music and who's had a larger influence on American music and global music, say in the 20th and 21st century, you might be naming a black person, you know, every third name, right? And, and you, may, you may go the entire conversation without naming a single Asian American, right? Maybe, maybe Yoko Ono, right? It's hard to even name a second. And yet, I think probably most people can name several black people who were absolute musical icons. So if you're, if you're just scoring music, right, then you have to talk about the outsized contribution black culture has made. It just depends which specific element you're talking about. Yeah. Again, th this is the disparity fallacy that you cited earlier on as half of the racism treadmill, that, that if the disparity that works in the favor of a, mi a minority group is unobjectionable to cite, but one that works to their disadvantage can only be cited as a symptom of your own bigotry, well, then we never get out from under this game. And yeah, I mean, there, there are many disparities that work to the advantage of black people or any other minority group, which you wouldn't be. I guess, you know, the truth is, occasionally you are, you do come under the shadow of some allegation of racism or a concern about racial difference when citing black athletic achievement, I think. I mean, I think if, you're, if you notice that in the Olympics, you know, the 100 meter final is virtually always won. In fact, it has always been won, I believe, since 1986. I should know this. I cited this in my wonderful conversation with Ezra Klein, you know, by, by someone of West African descent, no matter what country they were competing for. To celebrate that or to even notice that is, I guess, perceived as uncharitably reductive of black people to some attribute that is physical as opposed to mental. I mean, I don't know precisely what the concern is there, but it's, you know, this is a fact that could be celebrated in the same spirit in which you just talked about musical contribution. Right, right. And I think ultimately, this goes back to what you mentioned at the beginning, just about race not being an intrinsically interesting thing to talk about. Like, ultimately, this stuff should seem less and less interesting to study, I would argue. Yeah. It's like taking a group of people by whatever variable, whether it's race or ethnicity, and just, you know, drawing a circle around them, measuring some mean statistic and comparing it to another one. That kind of research is only useful if you presuppose that whatever you're going to find is evidence of discrimination that can then be stamped out. But once you notice that there are just way too many disparities for all of them to be attributable to discrimination, it just becomes less interesting to you know, talk about 
racial disparities on, on whatever metric all day. I mean, the reason I feel I have to do it is because I'm trying to attack sets of beliefs that are seemingly justified by all of these disparities that are cherry picked to create the impression that disparities are evidence of racism. Yeah. And, and I mean, the, the, mo the most extreme examples are not very far away. I mean, I just, I was talking to a friend not long ago who works for a corporation I won't name, but, you know, one of his coworkers who is a um, black woman who apparently has, you know, truly awesome hair and is constantly changing her hair and, you know, putting it in pigtails and otherwise making it look doubly awesome. She considers any compliment about her hair coming from a white person to be a racist microaggression. So you hear a story like that, which, again, I don't know how well subscribed, you know, this kind of attunement to racial difference and the possibility of racism is at the moment. But it seems like, you know, virtually every noise you hear from the left is pointing in this direction now. And, you know, I say this as a liberal, I hear something like this, and it just seems like a confession of mental illness. It's so unnecessary to live in the world that way, no matter what has preceded us. We can acknowledge the history of, of racism and racial disparity and, and the present reality of racial disparity with respect to economics or, or anything else we care about. But to be living that way now and to not only it's become a kind of new religion to install these various tripwires in your mind and simply wait to be offended. And I mean, this is, you know, again, this is now the colossal orange counterpoint to all of this is Trump. But I'm quite worried that what's happening on the left with respect to these kinds of conversations is going to guarantee that things get worse and worse on the right until we reach some kind of crisis point. Yeah, well, I, I, can, I can say personally, I went to a high school where we had morning meeting presentations with the whole school there about microaggressions. And at this time, I was a card-carrying, hard-left progressive. I was the type of person who would language police white people when they made a joke I didn't like. I was exactly the kind of person who would be extremely sensitive about his hair. I had a big mm. afro. And, you know, in fairness, you know, when I was in middle school, I did feel that my afro you know, it, it got me a kind of attention that it, it wasn't quite bullying. It was, it was kind of just a kind of a touching that I didn't like. And, you know, the average seventh grader might sort of take offense to, but it was nothing near as bad as what, you know, the overweight kids experienced in middle mm. school, right? It was just like, it was of a piece with the fact that for various reasons, that time of life can be hard for everyone, right? So, but, but I used to, I consider myself somewhat indoctrinated, to have been somewhat indoctrinated by all of these beliefs. Well, that's interesting. So, so let's linger on that moment of exodus from those seminars. How did your views change? At what point and what, what, what were the tipping points? There were a couple different things. I think it was right when I went to college I started hanging out with people from different parts of the country because of college. You know, my roommate was from Arizona and became my best friend. He's like a white guy from Arizona. Might describe himself as a liberal at the time, but was very much as sort of, you know, old style liberal in the sense that not being down with any of the progressive ideology that I was very enthusiastic about. And when you become really good friends with people like that, and you just notice that they're not evil. It can be a profound change of frame for you, right? Because like before, I would literally view my social life, you know, in conversations on topics that were at all controversial, very much through the inter intersectional frame, because it was the only framework on offer to me as a person who cared about ideas at, you know, 17, 18 years old. I was just living out the narrative that was handed to me with all of the passion or much of the passion that you've rightly criticized on the far left now. And, you know, a, a mixture of talking to people of different perspectives after having become friends with them for other reasons. 
a mixture of just actually hearing the arguments against my position by listening to podcasts and reading books, because I, I, I'd never heard the arguments against far left views you know, presented charitably as if they weren't coming from Nazis. So it, it's, it's just both. It's the social aspect and the intellectual aspect. Yeah, well, that's interesting because, that, you know, hence the point we just made about the influence of culture. I mean, we're, what we're talking here about with respect to intersectionality is the influence of various ideas and cultural ways of talking about these issues. And also, your experience in college does advertise rather well for the importance of having a diverse student body. This takes us to issues like affirmative action and whether diversity is such a, an important goal that we should be you know, making it harder for Asians to get into Harvard the way we have been apparently for many years. And I, I think one figure you cite is that Asians have to score 450 points higher than blacks to have the same odds of being admitted into the best colleges in the U.S. And now, you know, famously, there's a, an Asian, I think, class action suit against Harvard. How do you think about affirmative action? Let's just take the college case because it's, you know, it's so close to the story you just told. What do you think about the importance of diversity and the importance of fairness and those two values being in apparent conflict with respect to admissions into the best schools? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's definitely a tricky question. And I'm not one to totally write off diversity completely. I would rather see it become more about income diversity. If you could just transfer all of the racial preferences into income preferences, the effect, because Blacks are disproportionately poor and Hispanics as well, the effect might not be all that different, but it just it doesn't seem right for someone like me who grew up upper middle class to need you know a racial preference you know to get preference over an Asian in New York City who's extremely poor right there's this New York Times editorial a few weeks ago about integrating the elite high schools in New York, and there was kind of a throwaway line in there that said. Many of the Asian American families who populate these schools scrimp on essentials like food to pay for test, test prep. And, and the tone of this article suggested that Asians somehow had an unfair advantage, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. In the same article that it just said they were scrimping on food to prepare for test. You know, I, I'm just not comfortable, you know, penalizing Asians for the past behavior of whites. We can get into the evidence of what affirmative action actually does, right? Because you have to distinguish the principles that motivate the policy from the effects of the policy. It's not at all clear that it has been a net good just for blacks, right? There's the mi mismatch effect that Richard Sander, I believe is his name, the UCLA law professor, has documented where you're putting black kids who would do very well at, say, a second-tier school into a first-tier school, and the professors are teaching to the middle of the class, and you're making that black kid much more likely to drop out, much more likely, you know, if they went in going for a STEM degree, much more likely to switch to a less demanding major. There's one study from the 80s that studied black MIT freshmen, or it might, it might have been all undergrads, black undergrads that found that while they were in the top 10% of math scores nationwide, the average score was in the bottom 10% of math scores at MIT, right? So they, they, like by any objective standards, these are some of the smartest kids in the nation that could do well at many good schools. But you, know, you might worry about the effect that that has on stereotypes when everyone is noticing that the black kids in class tend to do worse. You could worry about what that does to the attrition rate, because the same study found that close to one fourth of black students at MIT didn't graduate. There's more evidence to get into here mm -hmm. if, if you want to, but. Yeah. Well, so, so that point you just made about black students in STEM areas that are put in the, the most competitive context based on affirmative action, and it's not serving them. That's a point that Charles Murray made on my podcast, for which he was, you know, savaged as a racist. 
So, I mean, the data are whatever they are. I mean, you know. Well, well I can just cite something here because, you know, we, we have the natural experiment of California, which passed Prop 209 in 1996, which essentially gutted affirmative action overnight. And what happened, what, I mean, all of the, there were doomsayers predicting that the rate of black college graduation would go down. There would be too few Blacks and Hispanics graduating and enrolling in the first place. None of that happened. Essentially, all of the, everything that would be predicted to happen by mismatch theory essentially happened. So the proportion of Blacks and Hispanics who went on to graduate in four years went up by 55%. Even the total number of Black and Hispanic bachelors went slightly up as a raw number. And the proportion who graduated in four years with STEM degrees went up by 51%. And then, you know, at a school like UC San Diego, the GPA gap between blacks and whites all but closed. That's the one natural experiment we have, and it seems fairly conclusive. And your point about class, I think, is great, because if you were biasing with respect to class, you would be accomplishing several things at once. One, you would actually be giving an advantage to people who have been disadvantaged because you know being poor is obviously a disadvantage both with respect to resources and with respect to time you would as you point out be by definition grabbing more blacks and hispanics because more blacks and hispanics are economically disadvantaged and yet you'd be able to use the same criteria for admission so that you know the blacks and hispanics that would get through the door there would be every bit as good uh, you know, with respect to test scores and GPA and all that as the Asians and, and whites they would be competing against. And so you wouldn't have this effect at the end in the classroom where people would find themselves in the wrong class, essentially, because they were put there based on a quota. i got to think that experiment's being run widely somewhere. Well, there, there, actually, there actually is uh, Amy Wax just published a, a great piece about the you know the different educational programs that are being used at the middle and high school level to try to improve outcomes for blacks and hispanics and and one is the income integration model you just look at income and you you take blacks and hispanics or anyone from a poor background and put them into a school in a middle class area insofar as there's one close enough and the evidence there is is mixed it's not entirely conclusive that that would be good at the middle and high school level, but it could have much better results at the college level, certainly better than using race as a criterion. Okay, well, let's talk about Amy Wax for a moment, because I don't know Amy. Uh, We've never met. I think we've exchanged one email about something, but, you know, I've admired her conversations with Glenn Lowry. I think they've had really amazing conversations on his podcast, but she has been just defenestrated in liberal circles for having said that very much on the point we've been discussing, she's worried that, you know, she virtually always sees her black students in the bottom of the class, you know, in the bottom half of the class and and not, you know, rarely in the top half, I think is more or less what she said. And, you know, that, that is tantamount to expressing racism, you know, in her job. And then, you know, many people have worried what would be the experience of a black student obliged to take her class at, I think, uh, University of Pennsylvania Law School. But she has this thought experiment that you reference in your most recent piece. She calls it the parable of the pedestrian. Yeah, let's start a chapter on Wax and her parable here, because the parable is quite useful for framing a discussion about how history, whatever is true there, may be a poor guide to how to chart a path from the present to a future we all want to inhabit. Backing up a second, I think when they ask, what is it like to be a black kid in Amy Wax's class who's heard her say that, I I totally grant that that could be deeply uncomfortable. The question that is never asked is, what is it like to be the black kid in MIT struggling in every single class just because you, you know, you're not in the 1%, you're in the top 5%, right? Like, what is that like? That is a question that is never asked by the same people who, you know, certainly claim, and I I believe do believe that they are concerned about the experiences of black students. So you can't have it both ways. You can't 
claim to care about black students' feelings on the Amy Wax question and not engage honestly with the data on mismatch. So going to her, her parable, the par parable of the pedestrian, which is just imagine that a pedestrian gets hit by a car and suppose that it's exactly the kind of injury that does not admit of any surgical treatment that we have. It's just precisely the kind of injury that can only be fixed by painstaking years of physical therapy. Just posit that it's Bill Gates who hit you. If there were a surgery that cost $10 billion, you could just get the damages from him and, and get the surgery, but the surgery just doesn't exist, right? So in that context, you could certainly I mean, say, say you're the victim. You could, you could say, well, listen, it's not fair that I have to you know, heal myself. I wasn't the one that injured myself. It was the driver's fault. He ran a red stoplight, say. You could accuse someone of victim blaming who said, listen, you know, I know the driver victimized you, but it just is the case that you're the only one who can make yourself whole. And it, it is profoundly unfair that you're the only one that can make yourself whole. And yet it, it simply is the case. And, and it's actually a failure of empathy to block off advice for that person under the epithet of victim blaming or anything like that. So, so that's an intuitive example of the fact that the person who causes an injury cannot always heal it, right? And this is, this is an analogy to be made for Black Americans. You know, so just stipulate, I'll just grant for the sake of argument, that every cultural element of the Black community that I might want to talk about and criticize, just grant that it is the fault of white people in some way, shape, or form, or history, or historical racism, the legacy of slavery, Jim Crow. I mean, I don't actually believe that that's true, but I, I can just grant it for the sake of argument. That tells you nothing about how to fix these problems, right? So take an example like the phenomenon of Black kids accusing each other of acting white for doing well in school, for, for instance. And, and we can get, many people are skeptical of that, and you know, I, I'd be happy to get into the evidence that it indeed happens and it indeed matters. But you could just stipulate, as Stuart Buck does in his book, Acting White, that this is entirely a consequence on the way in which desegregation was implemented in the 60s by white bureaucrats in Washington, right? It's it like not the fault of black people that this phenomenon arose, just you know, take fault completely out of the picture. The question we should ask is how do we make it so that 20, 30 years from now, black kids who do well in school are no longer accused by other black kids of acting white? You know, th those are just separable questions. Yeah. Well, it seems like an extremely useful distinction. And I mean, I guess the only way to embrace the utility of it is to acknowledge something that we acknowledged a few minutes ago, which is that these cultural differences matter. It may, if, if, in fact, you have a culture where, you know, a culture of teenagers where trying to do well in school is highly stigmatized, I mean, to whatever degree that's true, that's going to present a barrier to doing well in school. And, you know, there may be a hundred things like that, that, again, even if we stipulate that they're all the result of prior instances of racist policies, it's not clear that the way of fixing them is to implement some new policy at the government level. It may just be, as you know, to reference Wax's analogy, that the fix is some arduous change at the individual and cultural level of, you know, behavior and thinking. And this is an incredibly controversial thing to say about a culture. It's not a controversial thing to say about a, a family. Now I'm thinking about your, your most recent piece where you're talking about the wealth disparity between blacks and whites largely. And, you know, the claim that, you know, some cultures teach, you know, wealth building better than other cultures. And I mean, again, on its face, that is a controversial thing to say. But if you were just going to say some families teach wealth building better than other families, that's a trivially true thing to say. I mean, obviously, that's the case. If there's a family somewhere that is teaching their kids about compound interests, uh, you know, on their sixth birthday, 
That is a family very much unlike the family I grew up in. Cultures are on some level just very big families, and they will admit of different levels of emphasis on anything, uh, you know, wealth included. That's right. Yeah. And um, they can be quite, I mean, let, let me just back up to the, to the acting white phenomenon, because I, I think this is just the best example. There's a journalist named Ron Suskind who wrote a book in the 90s entitled A Hope in the Unseen. And he, he goes into a, a, a school, inner city school in D.C., and he opens the book with this anecdote where maybe the principal or the administrators of the school were trying to encourage success among their students. And they started giving awards. They started having ceremonies to give awards to the highest achieving students. And at first it worked. And then before long, the award winner would come up to claim his or her prize. And the thunderous jeering from the audience would start hurling epithets, calling this person a whitey, right? So it was just like nothing the teachers can do to control this, really. It's just thunderous coming from the students. And imagine being a smart black kid in that context where you just stand to lose so much from, from being smart. You know, I've been accused of acting white myself. There are over a dozen scholarly ethnographic studies that have found the phenomenon to be widespread there's about four studies that claim to not have found it, but, but the weight of evidence is clear. Barack Obama has talked about it twice. Michelle Obama talked about growing up and being accused of it. The rapper Jay-Z has talked about it in a New York Times interview. In any case, you know, like, I would bet all the money I have that there is nothing analogous to the acting white epithet in the Asian American community, for instance, right? Where like an, an, an Asian American student is, stands to lose enormous social status among other Asian Americans for doing well in school. Yeah. I mean, you can go further than that. You, we know there's the opposite bias. Right. Certainly at the family level. And that's true of so many cultural groups that have succeeded beyond their numbers in those areas. I mean, like, you know, Indian Americans and the Jewish community. I mean, it's like this is, no one has ever suffered among Jews for being too successful academically. And that's a stereotype about Jews that that would be so. Right. And, you know, I, I guess we can, we, can, we can get into the spending aspect of culture too, which I, well, I cited in my last... Yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about your last piece that proved the most controversial. I don't know if it was the most controversial because of the subject matter or just because you're now becoming more well-known and people are noticing what you're writing, and this is the fourth of four for Quillette, but what was that piece and what's your, your general thesis there? My general thesis there is that we have this fairly staggering racial wealth gap, this 10 to 1 racial wealth gap between blacks and whites. And the income gap is nowhere near that high. So it's just, it's useful to distinguish between income and wealth. Uh, as, as wealth accrues over generations, it's often handed from parent to child, or at least some of it is. And it has a lot to do with what you do with your money. And I, I just noticed, you know, scholars like Mirsa Baradaran, Richard Rothstein, and ta Coates have been talking about the wealth gap pretty often lately. I, you know, I don't go too long without seeing some article about it. And the standard narrative I hear coming from progressive academics is that it's you know, pretty much entirely a consequence of some combination of slavery, racist policies in the post-bellum South, and then racist New Deal era policies like redlining, where Black neighborhoods were unfairly considered to be credit risks. And if you were black, it was much harder or nigh impossible to get a government-backed mortgage loan to buy your first house. And then, and then you're off and running from a wealth building perspective. And it's also this, this claim that there was this almost magical economic period after World War II and before the civil rights movement that white Americans cashed in on that blacks were left out of. So half of my thesis there was just 
not questioning the historical facts of the matter there, but questioning how much of the wealth gap they explained. First of all, just given how many other ethnic groups, just, just, just given that there actually isn't much of a correlation between political mistreatment and you know, wealth building or you know, income, or, or the correlation is not tight enough for you to assume that groups that are politically mistreated will automatically become less wealthy and that and, to, and then to make the further cause, causal claim that the political mistreatment is the main cause or the entire cause of the wealth disparity. I also partially challenge the historical claim here just based on how much progress, how much economic progress blacks made between 1940 and 1960, which I, I thought just was given short shrift in, in many of the progressive accounts of that era of history. And then the second part of my thesis was to point out spending patterns that differ between blacks and whites that, in my view, account for some amount of the wealth gap. I couldn't say how much. I, I cite one study from uh, economists at UChicago and Wharton that suggested that fully 20% of the wealth gap was accounted for just by differential rates of spending on cars, jewelry, and clothes. And I found that to be such a shocking result that I had to email the study authors to confirm that I wasn't misreading it. And I also cite Nielsen data, Nielsen, one of the biggest marketing firms in the world, showing that black women are 14% uh, more likely to own a luxury vehicle than white women, 16% more likely to have purchased costume jewelry in the last year, and 9% more likely to have purchased fine jewelry. And, and those differences are unconditional on wealth, which is rather shocking, right? Because because if you have a group with one-tenth the wealth of another group, you would at least expect that group to be slightly less likely to spend money on things like luxury vehicles or jewelry, let alone more likely. I, I was highlighting this as an aspect that is more liable to being changed for the better. Right? We, we can't go back and undo redlining. It happened. The analogy I make here is to the feminist movement in the 70s. In the 70s, feminists could not go back and undo the thousands of years of misogyny that women faced. What they could do is start a public conversation around what women's roles in society should be. And they had an enormous effect doing that. In the 1960s, polling data shows that virtually Every American would have said women belong in the home. But by the 1990s, that was a minority viewpoint. And that's just feminists using public conversation to overturn hundreds, arguably thousands of years of cultural programming around gender roles. And there's no reason in principle why we couldn't do something like that with the specific elements of Black culture that I feel are, are worth talking about. There are a few reasons why this piece was so controversial. One is that you're, you're making the point about the fact that there are these other disadvantaged groups that not only have done better than blacks on average, they've done better than whites on average. And, and yet you can't argue that they had any advantage over whites, certainly. And about, I'll just give our listeners one paragraph here so, to get, so they can get a sense of what you did here. But so this is now you Starting with the California Alien Land Law in 1913, 14 states passed laws preventing Japanese-American peasant farmers from owning land and property. These laws existed until 1952, when the Supreme Court ruled them unconstitutional. Add to this the internment of 120,000 Japanese-Americans during World War II, and it's fair to say that the Japanese were given no bootstraps in America. Nevertheless, by 1970 census data, show Japanese Americans out-earning Anglo-Americans, Irish Americans, German Americans, Italian Americans, and Polish Americans. For Asian Americans on the whole, an analysis of wealth data from 1989 to 2013 predicted that their, quote, median wealth would soon surpass the white median level. If wealth differences were largely explained by America's history of favoring certain groups over, the, over others, then it would be hard to explain why Asian Americans, who were never favored, are on track to become wealthier than whites. And you could say the same 
for Jews, obviously. I mean, if having you know half of your people systematically exterminated in the middle of the 20th century, and now these are my words, you know, it wasn't some sort of disadvantage. It's hard to imagine what would be, and yet it's a caricature of the Jews to say that they have succeeded really, you know, virtually everywhere they've applied themselves with respect to wealth creation and, you know, most measures of secular success. I mean, so these comparisons will be viewed as invidious, and there's this concern that you're just not grappling with how unique the African-American case is. And again, this doesn't get around Amy Wax's concern that, you know, understanding the cause is not, doesn't indicate the path forward, but some of the pushback must be based on a sense that you've given the cause short shrift. And I, I feel this because a friend of mine, who I mentioned to you in, in an email thread, wrote me when he saw that I had retweeted your article. And I'll leave him anonymous because I don't have his permission yet. I didn't ask if I could drag him into this. But he, he's a very smart white guy, for what that's worth, who also happens to have a degree in African American studies from Harvard. So he's a white guy who's unusually close to these issues. And he sent me an email, and I'm quoting him. Think about how shockingly counterintuitive the claim is that racialized economic inequality owes vanishingly little to slavery, Jim Crow, housing discrimination, hiring discrimination, promotion discrimination, inheritance, credit access, predatory lending, cultural stigmatization, welfare policy, project housing, incarceration, etc. It's not theoretically impossible that these forces have not had an impact, but the burden of proof should rest heavily on any argument with that essence. Anyone thoughtful obviously recognizes that these forces, along with cultural and other variables, interact in extremely convoluted and overlapping processes that are difficult to tease apart. Of course, if we're able to create a race-blind society, knowing how to unwind the racialism of the society we've inherited requires interrogating this complexity. We need to know what to fix if we're to remedy the perennially negative outcomes. Suggesting that the remedy simply comes down to blacks getting their shit together culturally is condescending and simplistic on the surface. That was the end of his reaction. So, um, you know, I, I just tee that up for you. How do you respond to that concern? A, I find it condescending that if a white person who happened to be poor was buying lots of jewelry, you could tell them, listen, that's not wise. But if a black person were doing that, you can't tell them. You have to put on kid gloves. I find that condescending, first of all. Second of all, I would argue that I was attacked for giving, for supposedly claiming that history is irrelevant. I didn't know such thing. I'm certain that specifically the history of redlining is some, some part of the story. I wouldn't be willing to put a percentage on it. You know, is it, is it half? Is it more than half? Is it less than half? I think it's much too complex a question to answer that. The third thing I would say is, I would say the onus is on people like him and people who agree with him to explain why black West Indians living in the same city in 1970, and these are second generation West Indians, so born in America. So, so you're holding the variable of race constant holding the variable of being born and educated and having lived in the same city, constant, holding the legacy of slavery, roughly constant, because they're, they're both slaves. You know, many, many of these people would have been completely indistinguishable from American blacks, evidenced by the fact that most people don't even know that people like Stokely Carmichael, Marcus Garvey, Sidney Poitier, they were all of West Indian descent. Malcolm X is half West Indian. You have to explain why they were out earning blacks by 58% in 1970. Likewise, I think there's a, there's a way in which, well, let's just, as a thought experiment, imagine that Jewish Americans were doing very poorly by economic standards. And uh, let, let's say that the history was identical. The Holocaust happened exactly the way it did. Pogroms happened the way they did. The laws keep, that had quotas on Jews in the, in the American Ivy Leagues happened precisely the way they did. But for, for whatever reason, Jewish Americans, instead of being the second highest earning income group, were, were somewhere at the bottom of the list. And someone came along and said, well, well listen, I, I think 
there are some cultural factors here at play. Imagine how they would be jumped on. How dare you ignore the legacy of the Holocaust and pogroms and the, the anti-Semitism in America? And you know, you could say this much the same about the Japanese. If they were at the bottom of the list, people would be saying, "How dare you ignore the alien land laws and World War II, etc." It, it just it can't be that our opinions about what caused what are just contingent on the fact that Jews and Japanese happen to be doing quite well on the average. So that would be my response to that. The other thing, I think, fundamentally, what this comes down to is differing theories of what wealth is and how wealth is built and whether politics comes before economics or whether economics tends to come before politics. So the poverty rate for blacks was 87% in 1940. By 1960, that had dropped to 47%. And that trend line kept going through the civil rights era, but it didn't accelerate, nor did the income gains accelerate, right? So it was a continued trend from an era which, with virtually no, at least no effective civil rights policies to an era with all of the civil rights you know, policies that we have on the books today. And yet, if you just look at, look at it from an economic point of view, the trend lines were virtually the same, in some respects, better before the civil rights movement in terms of Blacks entering professional occupations at a, at a slightly higher rate. So I, I think there is a misunderstanding about exactly why economic success happens. I think there is a undervaluing of human capital, which is just you know the economist's term for the set of skills and knowledge possessed by any given person or possessed by any given group. And I, I think that's more what I'm mm. rubbing up against. Well, I, I think um, you and I fully agree on one principle here that has been has come up a dozen times so far in, in this conversation, which is there are many double standards, which, you know, double standards almost by definition are counterproductive. I mean, they'll, they'll be perceived by somebody to be unfair. They'll put you in contradiction with yourself. I mean, so these double standards are dysfunctional. And the one that is especially galling is the double standard around the ethics of the, or the norms of civil discourse. And, and there's two people here who have kind of typified this double standard of late, and you, you've written about both of them. One is Michael Eric Dyson and his performance in the Monk debate against Jordan Peterson, and the other is Tan Hasi Coates, who we've just mentioned. I don't know if you, how you want to deal with this issue, but it just seems like there is a all too frequent phenomenon now, now where you have black public intellectuals who will say things which forget about the factual accuracy of, of you know, their interpretation of events that is causing them to say these things. Let's stipulate that they're right about the, you know, all the relevant history. They still are saying things and reasoning in ways or failing to reason in ways which would be called out as starkly racist if done by really anyone else. I mean, I, it wouldn't even just have to be white guy. I don't think Asians could get away with what these guys are getting away with. How do you view this problem? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I think this is a function of white guilt. I think, you know, when, when Michael Eric Dyson calls Jordan Peterson a mean, mad white man as a substitute for an argument against his claims, yeah, I think he did it twice too. I think he doubled down on it when when Jordan objected. Yeah, right. Yeah. So so when he when he makes Jordan Peterson's race you know, relevant or makes it seem relevant to his argument and just invokes the the black card, basically, I have to think a lot of people in the audience know that that's an invalid move. They have to know, but to criticize someone like Michael Eric Dyson openly and in the terms in which he deserves to be criticized, in the terms in which any white person would be criticized had they made an analogous claim about a black intellectual. To criticize him in, in that way, it just, you know, people respond to the incentives facing them. So if you're going to go out on Twitter and say, this is ridiculous as a white person, there's a profound disincentive from doing that because of 
all the blowback you'll you'll get. Likewise with Ta-Nehisi Coates. I mean, sorry, I mean, Coates is even a worse case than Michael Eric Dyson, because I think, as you say, many people could instantly detect what was wrong with his move in, in that debate. But for Coates, I mean, he really has been canonized as a kind of secular saint by the left. And I, I get the sense that people over at the Atlantic, where he up until recently was employed with the great fanfare, I think he's moved on to do something else now. But it seems to me that very few people on the left see what's wrong with what he's up to. And, and you know, I've said publicly that, I mean, but many people have asked me to have him on the podcast. I've said publicly that I'm not at all inclined to because I think it would be a disaster. I think, he, I mean, the way he plays the race card, I mean, I really view him as a kind of pornographer of race. I mean, what he's doing is he's giving voice to his own personal pain, uh, you know, which could be legitimately earned, I mean, no doubt, but he's broadcasting his psychology onto the world and declaring that that's the world we live in. And that's the, not only that's the world we live in, that's the world we'll always live in. And it seems like, you know, his white audiences think that the only appropriate response to this is just, you know, masochistic assent to it. They're just grateful for being told yet again how racist they are and how racist they'll always be. And the only appropriate response for a black person like yourself, according to these audiences, is just to spiral down into this singularity of utter obsession with the color of everyone's skin and just stay there for eternity. I really don't see a path forward, you know, much less a wise or practical one, being sketched by Coates. And it just, there's just something fundamentally dishonest and peculiar about his project. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's less about Coates and more about the way in which, like you claim, that he has been sanctified by people I would otherwise see as quite rational people on the left. And, and you, you hear, you see similar things just in the New York Times, for example. There, there was a piece I quote in the same piece in which someone named Ikao Yanka, maybe pronouncing that wrong, argues, she, I think she says, if I'm remembering the quote, as against our gauzy national hopes, I will teach my boys to have profound doubts that friendship with white people is possible. This is a person teaching their black sons, you know, their young black sons, to be suspicious of young white boys and girls that they go to school with, right? I mean, this is absolutely insane. It is racist drivel. And it's also, I, I mean, this is so, so bad to me. It's doubly bad because children tend to be much more rational about race than adults. Like, it's not till you get to the teenage years that people tend to self-segregate or really care about race all that much at all. And to encourage children who are otherwise just open to friendship with whomever, to encourage them to view race as important in such a critical point in their lives, no one at the New York Times should have fallen for that. That is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so unfortunately, uh, Coates, uh, I think, has declined the invitation to join you and Glenn Lowry and Ibram X. Kendi and, and a few others on, on the panel on race at this conference we'll be at together in New York in November. My disinclination to have him on the podcast is not synonymous with my disinclination to see him talk in public about these issues with people qualified to rebut him. It's just the optics of having a white guy repeatedly get slammed with his, what I would consider disingenuous racial maneuvers, and was something I, I wanted to decline. But I very much wanted to see you and Glenn talk to him and, and others on that panel. But uh, the panel will be no less incendiary and interesting for his absence, I think. I think you'll find uh, a lot to debate with some of the, the remaining panelists. So it just, you know, and I see we're at the two-hour mark here. Coleman, is there anything else you want to um, touch before I look forward to the time that we will uh, be able to do this face-to-face? -face? I think that's that seems good for now. Well, again, you are absolutely ahead of the game in every respect because you're writing so beautifully and 
clearly. And I think I called you eloquent and I think I called you restrained also in that tweet. And I also got hammered for calling you restrained. Like, I don't know what the person was reading <laughs> into that. But what, what, what I meant was that the chief sin of someone your age that virtually every writer, whatever their talent has at your age, is to be overwriting. You've got none of that. I mean, so it's, it's just so beautiful to see you dealing with these issues. I mean, you're, you know, there's just absolutely nothing you need to change about your style going forward. You're just in a great spot. So all I can say is keep it up. I appreciate it, Sam. If you find the Waking Up podcast valuable, there are many ways you can support it. You can review it on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can blog about it or discuss it on your own podcast. Or you can support it directly. And you can do this by subscribing through my website. That's samharris.org. And there you'll find subscriber-only content, which includes my Ask Me Anything episodes. You also get access to advanced tickets to my live events, as well as streaming video of some of these events. And you also get to hear the bonus questions from many of these interviews. And then there's the Waking Up course, an app built for iOS and Android, which I'll be releasing soon as a subscription service, which supporters of the podcast get for free. All of these things and more you'll find on my website at samharris.org. Thank you for your support of the show. It's listeners like you that make all of this possible.